All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Becker. I'm the VP of Communications here at Visit California, and thanks for joining our uh, webinar today, our Outlook Forum Plus webinar on uh, navigating Dot Dash Meredith. Um, I want to start by thanking our partners at Dot Dash Meredith for working with us uh, to pull this um, session together. Meredith's been a longtime partner of the Visit California program, and through their partnership, we've transformed our consumer content program. And they've been there helping us to continue innovate, innovating in the content marketing space. So today we're going to get a, a bit of a peek inside um, Dot Dash Meredith as it begins a new chapter, uh, continuing to grow its portfolio and its consumer influence. I think worth noting, and you'll hear this um, today, is that uh, Dot Dash Meredith effectively reaches 90% of all American women. And that's a really crucial audience for all of us in the travel promotion space. Um, our Visit California research indicates that uh, of, of uh, domestic trips, 62% of them are planned by women in, a, in the household. Um, we're also going to hear from three editors today on how we can engage with Dot Dash Meredith's many publications. Uh, and although we've had uh, several um, in-person events already, we, and we expect this to um, pick up more as the pandemic recovery continues, we're really happy to be doing this in a virtual format where we can reach as many people as possible. Um, we have about 100 people joining us this morning, uh, and we're also going to post this recording um, on our industry website at industry.visitcalifornia.com, so you can share this with any of your colleagues who were unable to join this morning. You know, um, we're all eager to hear from our panel of editors, uh, and we're going to start with an introduction to Dot Dash Meredith from Michael Brownstein, the president of Client Partnerships and Magazines. Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ryan, and good morning, California, uh, although it's uh, afternoon here in New York. And um, I wish I was there with you in California, although I live in New York. My favorite state is California. And uh, my uh, son went to school at USC and then spent the next 10 years at his job in LA. And my daughter, um, who uh, moved to LA to pursue acting. And so, my wife and I thought that one day our kids are out there, we'll retire in California. Well, my son was transferred back. My daughter, uh, through COVID, her, her, her company, they, they transferred it back. So our kids ruined our plans for moving to California. But uh, we'll, we head there a lot. In fact, for a recent birthday, my wife uh, took me on a birthday trip to golf on Monterey and uh, drink some wine at Paso Robles. So, California is still in our hearts. So anyway, I'll, I'm sure I'll make it out there soon. Anyway, hi. Yes, I'm with uh, Michael Brownstein, uh, and I am the uh, president of Client Partnerships and Magazines at Dot Dash Meredith. And uh, I have been with Meredith for, wait for it, 29 years. Yes, I started when I was 15 years old. Uh, but um, I've been with the company a long time. Uh, but Dot Dash which is uh, owned by IAC, uh, which owns websites like Ticketmaster, Expedia, and others, uh, acquired us. And I'll tell you more about that. So Kelly, if you can go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about Dot Dash Meredith. So you know, a lot of people haven't heard of the company or Meredith, but I know you've heard of our brands. On the Meredith side are big brands, People, Entertainment Weekly, Martha Stewart, Travel and Leisure, in style, better homes and gardens, parents, health, food and wine, Southern living. These are iconic brands that have been around a long time. Better homes and gardens is celebrating its hundredth anniversary this year. Dot Dash began as about.com uh, and ch has changed its name to Dot Dash. Also, it's a digital company with all websites, and they have brands like LifeWire and Very Well and Investopedia, and so uh, my domain, et cetera. So you can see some of the brands here, about 50 large, uh, iconic, and trusted brands. So this company has put together the, the, so the digital chops of, of Dot Dash, plus the, the scale, the iconic brands of Meredith, and we have a, the largest publishing company in the US about digital, and magazine. So that's sort of a snapshot. You can see our brands of the new Dot Dash Meredith. The uh, acquisition happened on December 6th. So we're about four months new, although again, Meredith been around 125 years and Dot Dash about 10 years. 
Next slide, please, Kelly. And what is our mission? The, the one thing when, when Dot Dash sort of eyed the acquisition of Meredith, one thing that they was very attracted to was what both companies had in common was one thing, singular mission, to help people make decisions, take action and find inspiration. We're all about intent. And it's whether it's planning a vacation, putting dinner on the table, or reading about their favorite celebrities. They come to us to get stuff done. And our, what we do is we create the best intent-driven content and experience, whether it's mobile or magazines, engaging nearly 200 million people every month. And what this does is when they come to us for intent, this drives results for advertising partners because they came to get something done and we help them get, some, get stuff done. Next slide, Kelly. Just to give you a sense of our scale, the, the new company, just the digital scale, we reach 188 million unique users every month. And when you add the digital to the magazines, that's where you get that enormous reach of over 200 million. And you can just see the percentage of, uh, of various cohorts that we reach, 76% of all adults, 90% of women, 60% men, 84% multiracial women and 81% of Gen Z women. So we are the largest digital and print publisher in the US. Next slide. What we do is we have organized our company into verticals, vertical expertise, because one of the formulas we have is at the company is intent plus brands plus scale plus expertise. And we deliver information to the customers that come to us to uh, again to get stuff done and to take action but you can see the the verticals of where we play food home entertainment beauty travel health finance and, and tech in in all these categories we either number one or number two you can see some of the food brands from food and wine serious eats simply recipes uh, martha stewart home southern living a uh, magnolia uh, of course, uh, People is one of our big flagship brands, but you know, in health, travel and leisure, trip savvy, Midwest living, and of course, the California tourism business. So uh, you, know, you could either move some of these brands around if you put food and wine into the travel and to the travel vertical. I mean, so many people come to, to the brand for travel ideas. So we're very dominant in, in each, of these, uh, each of these categories, each of these verticals. Next slide, please. And we call them brand, we call our magazines brands because uh, they live in, in multi-platform, whether you uh, want to read in the magazine, online, all of our brands have got a social presence, uh, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, or TikTok. We want to be and reach, we want to be wherever the consumer is. And uh, because nobody, look, think of all your media habits, we're not an either or, we're an and. We read and we watch television and we're online and we're on our phone. So wherever they are, we wanna be the brand that helps them get, get stuff done. Next slide. Uh, we're also, privacy is a top priority for us. And you know, whenever you go on a website, you see, do you accept these cookies? Uh, this is gonna be a cookie-less world, but we don't need those cookies following people. We don't need to know who the, the, these folks are, but we do know is what they want to do. Because uh, they come to us for, uh, again, this intent-driven content, our content and context allows you to reach the right people at the right time without relying on those third-party cookies. So it's uh, naturally, uh, we aggregate audiences depending upon why they come to us for our content verticals. So privacy is a high priority at Dot Dash Meredith. Next slide, please. On the magazine side, again, we, we are the largest magazine publisher in America. Uh, we actually will print this year in 2022 350 million copies of magazines. Uh, that is made up of 36 million um, uh, subscriptions. In fact, a lot of our uh, uh, advertising clients were asked us, how did magazines do during the pandemic? Amazing. I mean, think about there was all this screen fatigue. 
uh, everybody was home. They looked forward to getting a magazine. We sold 1.1 million new online subscriptions in the last couple of years. We're also the dominant player on the newsstand. We have over 400 premium publications at newsstand. And we pretty much own those, those racks. So again, the, the, the dominant player there. And all that has translated to a consumer uh, demand. Uh, we've generated $800 million in consumer subscription and newsstand revenue. So again, we are the, the largest player and our consumers love magazines. In fact, we would love it if they were all digital, but our uh, women say they love the tactile, just reading through a magazine that's sort of laid back uh, relaxation. So our magazine business is doing very well. Next slide, please. If I want to end it with this and uh, sort of leave you with one message is that we are here to help. Uh, dot dash Merit combines best of class ad capabilities, first party data and insights and performance marketing expertise to become an essential partner. So no matter whether it is content or social or print or video, um, what we do is we're all about driving results for our customers. I know you're going to be involved in a, uh, in a sort of editorial uh, uh, table, right in a round table, but um, we know that uh, getting people to travel and come to your destinations is important. We can help you do that. And we're, we're proud to be working with you and thank you for your partnership. I think that's the last slide. Uh, I think uh, Ryan, you're going to take over here and I'm going to join at the end for some Q&A. I hope there's some, some good questions, so challenge us. Thank you so much, Michael. That was fantastic to uh, get a sense of the, the scale and structure of the company. Um, we're gonna jump into um, a conversation now with three editors from uh, publications that uh, Michael mentioned. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's worth noting that storytelling, if you're, if you're on this webinar, you're likely working in the storytelling space day, day in and day out. Um, now is a great time to be really be talking about and telling the California story. Um, panel, we're really thrilled to, to hear from you today and, and help us understand, help our audience understand some trends that you're following and, and how some of the changes in the, in the um, editorial and media space are impacting your, your operations and decision making. Um, we're going to do a quick round of introductions and hear from each one of our panelists about uh, themselves and their brand, and then we'll jump into a little bit of moderated Q&A. Um, as you saw on the slide, please submit your questions and we'll get to audience questions at the end of our conversation here. Um, so, Nina, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nina Ruggiero. I'm the Digital Editorial Director at Travel and Leisure. Um, as many of you probably already know, I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, so looking forward to talking California today. Great. Thank you. And Laura? Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Ratliff. Um, I am the Senior Editorial Director at Trip Savvy. Um, I've been with Dot Dash for about three years now. Um, and oversee all of the editorial content and strategy um, for Trip Savvy. Thank you, and Julia. Hey, I'm Julia. I'm the Senior Editorial Director at Parents. I have been with the Parents brand for seven years now, so I came over with Meredith. Um, and yeah, I oversee all the content strategy for Parents and Parents.com and the social channels. And I also uh, had the editorial team there. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, making time today. Um, we know you have busy schedules. We're going to jump right into our questions, and I'm going to start uh, with you, Julia, um, because I'm interested to hear about parents' uh, migration to a digital publication uh, and how that's impacting um, your editorial decision making, your timelines, and so on. So I have always worked on the digital side. So for me, not a lot has actually changed. And it's really important at the parents brand to meet our audience where they are. And for parents, I think um, it's often 
through search and it's often, you know, might be at like two in the morning when they need help um, determining whether or not to call the doctor if their baby's having a fever. So um, we are on parents.com or on social channels. We are also on Alexa with Alexa skills. We've got our parents tip of the day there. Uh, we're huge. Pro we've got podcasts. We're huge proponents of meeting our audience where they are. And the same was for the magazine too. I mean, we're a brand that's been around since 1926. So we are very well established. We're, we like to be the authority in parenting. We really want to make sure we're answering every single question any parent would ever have about anything to do with parenting all the way from five years before you even want to think about trying to conceive. And you might be thinking about long-term fertility all the way through to um, your relation, your adult relationship with your parents. So anything within the parenting remit and space, that is something that we want to be um, answering and providing content for. And for us, search has been a huge uh, chunk of where our audience comes to us from. People are putting questions into Google and coming to parents and we wanna make sure that we are answering them, whatever those questions may be. So I think digital is a great, you know, it may, most of our audience um, is has always come through digital and, and it's on mobile and it just makes sense to be there where they, they need us to be. And in terms of our editorial calendar, we're still thinking, we can still think up to a year or more ahead. We, we've all always done that. I mean, Google likes us to actually cover content up to six months before people are potentially searching for it. So just because th that is part of the process of Google being able to, to crawl some of these sites. So if we're, we're often thinking three months, six months ahead anyway, not too dissimilar to the way the magazine was in the past. So we'll continue that, that trend for digital. And at the same time, we're going to also continue to be reporting these you know, news stories that are within our the parenting beat, and we might be commissioning content, you know, same day, same morning, um, while also continuing to work on more evergreen content in ahead of time. So when it comes to something like travel, we'll be working, you know, two, two, three, four months ahead of some of the peaks that we're seeing around um, family travel to make sure that we have the content that that is accurate and. Um, you know, all encompassing for our audience to be searching when they're ready to be searching for it. Great, thank you. I can certainly vouch for the 2 a.m. Googling when the kid has a fever. That's yeah. definitely yeah. how it works. And we wanna make sure that it's the content's accurate, but also not stressful. We try to be, we try to be, um, help everybody feel seen. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Nina, let's go to you from travel and leisure's perspective. Um, what topics and destinations are your online readers really interested in right now? Sure. Um, so domestic destinations are definitely still top for us right now, um, particularly California and Florida. Um, we've seen Mexico and the Caribbean working as well. Um, and now we're sort of getting into, I don't want to call it basic Europe, but like the places that people always love in Europe, Italy, France. Um, we're still struggling a bit with kind of the um, more far-flung destinations, but expecting those to come back this year. Um, but in the meantime, as we focus on lots of domestic, um, we're seeing um, small towns performing really, really well. I think people are um, looking for kind of those hidden gem, less crowded um, destinations, especially if they have kind of beautiful um, scenery and outdoor activities, um, beaches, especially now as we start to head into summer. Um, and then in terms of other topics, train travel has been very big for us lately. Um, and outside of destinations and types of trips, it's been um, sort of travel hacks, um, mistakes not to make when visiting a place for the first time, um, insider tips and kind of ways to travel better, travel smarter. Um, that's all been performing really well. Great, and that's very helpful as we're thinking about crafting our uh, pitches for the coming months. Um, so Laura, uh, as travel communicators, we're, we're watching themes like mental wellness and solo travel and sustainability. Um, what kind of content uh, are you looking for um, right now? Sure. So it's timely that you mention um, solo travel as Trips Heavy just released um, a package of features dedicated to solo travel. So that went live on the site on Monday. So as you point out, that's definitely something um, that's top of mind for us. Um, 
we're in a little bit of an interesting position going into the pandemic compared to a travel and leisure or another travel site as Trip Savvy has historically focused, as some of you may know, on evergreen um, service content. So going into the pandemic, um, travel news coverage was not really something that we focused on or did a lot of. Um, so because of the pandemic, that's actually something that we have ramped up and made part of our content strategy um, with a lot of success, um, which is great. It gives us a lot of fluidity um, and, you know, a lot more, a lot of a greater ability to kind of be fluid and cover trends um, that maybe we didn't before. So as Nina points out, um, we see a lot of the same patterns and trends as TNL. Um, California and Florida are always huge for us. Um, same increase on Mexico and Caribbean focus. And um, it was funny that Nina mentioned train travel too, because trains just go nuts for us. I don't know if TNL is the same, but um, train travel is huge for us. And, you know, and then we also really see, um, I think as people, as people get back out there, I think they are seeking things that are a little more off the beaten path and unique um, places where they're not going to necessarily have to go and fight crowds. Um, you know, people are more comfortable with travel, but maybe less so with you know, having to deal with crowds once they get to a destination. So we're always looking for things that, you know, even if it is a popular destination, maybe there is a quieter neighborhood to stay in or, um, you know, a smaller museum that might not get a lot of attention that might be worth visiting. So that's what we're seeing right now. Great. Any theories on why train travel is, is bubbling to the surface these days? Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Laura. Um, I was just going to say that we were talking about that at, at TNL this morning. Um, and one of the finance brands at Dot Dash actually just did um, a study and they found that while, you know, we all know gas prices are, are going crazy and flight prices are going up, um, Amtrak is actually costing less um, and train prices are going down. So I think that's part of it. Um, you know, it's, kind of becoming one of the more affordable ways currently to travel. Um, and then, yeah, be, I mean, beyond that, I don't know. I, do you think, Laura, do you, did you see kind of people seeming more comfortable getting back on like an Amtrak train before they're comfortable getting back on a flight? That's what I was going to say. I think like, I think there is a greater sense of perceived safety around train travel. I mean, whether that is actually the case or not is, you know, up to an individual's perception. Um, and then I also think, um, you know, that there is like this like perceived nostalgia about it too, that I think is really appealing to a lot of people, right? Like I, you know, I'm sure we've all heard the term slow travel and train travel is kind of like the epitome of that, right? Like you get your rail pass or, you know, you ride up and down the California coast and, you know, that that's very different from just hopping on a flight from LA to San Francisco. That's fascinating. Um, I, I'd love Nina, your, your thoughts as well on the sustainable travel and solo travel um, themes. Is that something that you see kind of rising, continuing to, to be a priority among your readers? Yes. Um, you know, of course, April is a big time to cover sustainable travel, um, but we are trying to do that throughout the year um, and to put a larger emphasis on that. Um, in terms of solo travel, and I know you mentioned kind of uh, mental well-being, something that I've seen at TNL since the pandemic that's been really interesting is just kind of the format in that we cover those stories and um, the rise that we've seen in first person coverage of, you know, I went to the, I went on this wellness retreat and it, you know, saved me from what I was going through and things like that. I think um, I've been thinking a lot about why these first person stories have been performing so much better for us lately. And I think a lot of it is kind of, as people do get out and travel again, they, want to hear from people who actually already went out and did it first um, versus just kind of, you know, a faceless review. Um, I think it kind of just lends some expertise to the topic and people are really responding to that lately, especially on those types of topics. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to come back to you, Julia, for this question, but I'd love to hear from all the panelists on it. Um, the, the, the reach among American women is really incredible for the Dot Dash Meredith portfolio. Just wondering if that impacts your editorial decision making at all. We'll start with you, Julia. So we've always reached predominantly women at, at parents. And um, it's interesting because we're not necessarily a women's lifestyle brand in theory, apart from pregnancy, it, parenting should be a fairly gender neutral topic, but I think similar to, to, to booking travel, you're still seeing um, moms doing a lot of the, what we call it the mental load of, of parenting. So, and I often, we actually did a big editorial package on why is it that even when we have um, you know, very like game dads who are very, very involved, obviously. And the way we would always approach our editorial is, is in a gender neutral way. Why is it that moms are still doing a predominantly uh, more of some of the parenting tasks? And I think that includes booking travel. Um, and I always say it's right there in our data. It's right there in Google Analytics. You're seeing mostly women Googling parenting topics. Um, and, you know, that, but that is changing. We are doing a lot more, um, uh, content for, for dads. And I think for, for us, uh, thinking about gender equality in the parenting space, it's, it's almost that it's the more we can speak to dads and the more we can speak to dads as, as equal caregivers. Um, and, you know, also talk about the wide diverse, um, different kinds of families that you see in America today. That's a huge passion point for me. I mean, my entire podcast is based on that. There's just how no two families ever look alike and it's love that makes a family. So um, we really do lean on a, a wide diversity of family experiences at, at parents, but yes, predominantly women have always been, who have been um, coming to us mostly for parenting content. So that is something that we, you know, like to keep in mind when it comes to um, our content. And I think actually thinking about travel is a really interesting one. I think in the past, there was this guilt about traveling without your kids, like the, whether this idea that you could like, either as a couple, you know, if the parents go away by themselves or, um, but I think you're seeing a lot more solo travel actually with moms or moms traveling with their, their mom friends. Um, and just to kind of get a little bit of a, an escape since, you know, it still feels like moms, especially during these last two years of the pandemic, have been shouldering a lot of the parenting tasks. And, and a lot of that is, you know, there's plenty of joy in there, but there's also, <laughs> for anyone who's a parent in, in this um, webinar, there's also, you know, the struggle and the juggle is real. So um, I think that's interest, but I think the guilt is going away a little bit in terms of you're seeing more parents, um, taking adult only travel or going places where you have kids clubs, going places where you have um, uh, hotels or resorts doing background checks for babysitters and taking advantage of those of those services and not not feeling bad about it, knowing that that time away from your child um, or, you know, going on a family vacation where you can have some time away from your child and also do the kids stuff that actually that can make you feel like a better parent when you recharge you make you feel like a better parent when you when you are doing when you are with your kids so yeah I don't know doesn't totally answer your question but we've always had women women um googling parenting content yeah that's fantastic thank you mm -hmm. um Nina same question for you I guess the audience the audience lens um yeah so I I believe Ryan mentioned at the beginning you know we've always seen that women make the majority of the travel decisions, um, also lots of the purchasing decisions. Um, so that is something that we think about a lot at TNL. Um, the biggest thing for us lately has just been to make sure that we're reaching kind of every type of woman, women at every stage in their lives. Um, you know, we also will do lots of family travel, but we'll do the trips you should take, you know, in your twenties and your thirties and, you know, solo trips for women and trips that, you know, they can just get something special out of and also feel safe. And, and those types of concerns that are, can be unique to women when they're traveling. Um, women who are remote workers and, you know, traveling full-time while working. And, uh, we do tons of e-commerce content, um, you know, and we do e-com for both men and women, of course, but I think we do skew a bit female um, on that. We sell lots of like comfortable travel shoes and um, of course, luggage and all of those things. So so we, we just do always kind of have that consumer in mind, although we are also trying to kind of reach everyone. Great, and Laura? Yeah, so um, 
like the other brands, you know, we definitely um, do write with women in mind. I think uh, last I checked, I think about 73% of our readership is women. And as Nina points out, um, you know, women do make a majority of travel decisions, um, you know, for their households and their families. Um, you know, one thing I think we've focused on, especially in the past two years, and this is um, something that Julia pointed out for parents too, is, um, you know, even if we are writing toward women, recognizing that women come from so many different places of experience and background. And so really trying to make sure that, you know, we don't try and lump all women's travel experiences in one, I think this is especially important. We kind of talked about solo travel, right? That, you know, my experience as a solo traveler is going to be different than Nina's or Julia's um, or a woman of color. And so really trying to bring those voices into the mix. And that means, you know, we had a feature um, that we ran last month about two single moms who took a trip to Hawaii with their kids, you know, and that's still a story that is focused on women, but brings in a different voice for family travel, um, you know, that sometimes might get overlooked. So definitely focused on women, but really trying to amplify the diverse voices and experiences that women encounter when they travel or when they're planning their trips. Great, thank you. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, we're going to save a few minutes at the end of our conversation for audience Q&A. So if you have questions, no need to wait until that point. You can pop them into the Q&A and uh, we'll segue to those here in just a few minutes. Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, and um, why don't we stay with you, Laura? Um, I'll, I'll, we'll go around the room, though, on it. I'd like to hear from each of you about you, you clearly work heavily in the digital space. How much social media optimization do you do how and what do you do to drive traffic back to your publications yeah so this is um kind of an interesting question for legacy dot dash as a whole um as those of you who are familiar with the company know that for a very long time um our bread and butter has been search content um google remains um, the way the majority of readers get to our content. Um, and it's only really, you know, within the past year or two that um, the company has kind of focused on diversifying that piece of the pie. So I mentioned that news coverage was something that's newer to Trip Savvy. And when we're planning news stories, um, driving traffic from social has become a huge priority there, right? Because a news story, like Julia mentioned, Google takes time to index content and process content and send readers there from search. Um, so when we're thinking about news, social is top of mind for us. And so we kind of lump that into multiple things at Trip Savvy, whether that's Facebook, um, driving readers from our newsletter list, or um, we actually see a lot of traffic from places like Flipboard um, and Google Discover. So we, you know, kind of have some like rudimentary learnings about like what works well and like when we think a story is going to pop. Um, and we definitely write to that accordingly. Very insightful. Thank you. Nina? Yeah, um, social media is not our number one traffic driver at TNL, but it is a hugely significant traffic driver for us. Um, we have almost 15 million followers across our different platforms. Um, so it's obviously very important to us as a brand. Um, in terms of you know, driving traffic to articles. Um, Facebook tends to be still number one for us and then Instagram, but we're also on, you know, Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn and our TikTok is really growing. Um, we've been doing some really fun things there lately, actually, if, if anyone hasn't had a chance to check that out. Um, we're, we're, we're up for a Webby Award right now for social media, which um, is exciting. And um, we're selling social first campaigns more than before. Um, actually, I believe including Visit California. So thank you. Um, and so yeah, that's something that we're always thinking about when we're sending writers out and staffers to, um, to travel and to write stories for the site. Um, they're almost always including a social component. Um, lots of Instagram takeovers and now some TikToks as well. Great. And Julia, same question for you. So I always say with search, you have to know what you're searching for. 
right? So you have to know like what you what you want and you put that into search. And that, so a lot of our content around best um, family resorts or best baby moons, we see a lot of search co content around. But anytime we wanna do anything that's a bit of a thought leadership piece or introducing our audience to a new concept, then yes, we're gonna be relying on social traffic. And actually social traffic is probably upwards from uh, a quarter to a third of our of our our traffic at parents so it's not insignificant and most of that comes from Facebook um, but we see a ton of audience engagement on Instagram and I always say I try not to sleep on Pinterest especially I think in the parenting space I think there's a lot of opportunity there I think there's also been a lot of updates recently to Pinterest so that it's becoming it is a little bit like a search engine in and of itself but um but there's I think definitely opportunity there as well people are still using it and it's especially a tool that I think is helpful for parents. Um, so yeah, social is very important to, to us, uh, both from an engagement point of view, but then also from a traffic point of view. And I think um, one thing that we try to make sure that we, we actually are, are putting together a task force of community moderators, because I think one of the most important things about social is to make sure that everyone feels like they're in a safe space and the conversations are good and the topics are engaging. But every single piece of content we have on parents, we're thinking about how we're marketing it or how we're putting it out on social. We, we might do a different headline for social than we would do with the, um, from the headline that's actually on the page. Um, we might also think about how we're going to package that, whether that's through uh, an Instagram story or an in-feed post or a carousel, or yes, I think I think there's a huge amount of opportunity on TikTok and Reels, especially in the parenting and the parenting space. I mean, I think so social media is a really great place to really kind of like pull back the curtain on what it really means to be a parent today and be honest about it. And I think as we're seeing our biggest cohort of audience on parents.com is ages 25 to 34, but well, 25, that's Gen Z. And so thinking about how Gen Z likes to consume content, I think is really important. And thinking about what social media platforms Gen Z is using, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, um, is something that we're, we're actively thinking about as at parents, since our demographic is pretty young. Great, thank you. All right, so before we segue to audience questions, um, I'd just love to hear from each of you a little change of pace. Where was the last place that you traveled and some one thing that stuck with you from that uh, experience? So Julia, we'll start with you. I feel like I'm gonna get brownie points for this, but the last place I traveled was LA actually. And I went just with my, my, my friends. So didn't bring my daughter, I'm a single mom. Uh, my daughter's almost six, but I went without her just to have like an LA, um, five days. And I think just for me, the, 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 every time I go to California and I, and I, and I feel like, <laughs> um, I have, the right, I have the right audience for all this, but, um, just how, how the diversity of, of experiences you can have when you go to a California city and LA is no different. So we were able to go to Palm Springs for lunch. Um, and then we were also, you know, I was, went to go see a friend of mine in Malibu and, and, and then we had lunch, uh, we had amazing oysters in Santa Monica. Uh, and it was just like the difference I feel like, and then we, we were going out in West Hollywood. I felt like I had, even though I was there only for like, I think four days, maybe it was five. Um, I felt like I had like five, six different little mini vacations within my bigger vacation. Just, just how many different things. And the fact that you can go to California and experience all these different things. I mean, I adore California. So I was happy to be here today. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Julie is on the leaderboard with a California <laughs> trip and name dropped, I think five different California destinations. So Nina, we'll go to you. Um, first of all, Julia, I'm really impressed that you covered that much ground in four days. Um, I'm gonna go with the California theme as well um, because I, you know, I'm based in LA, but I'm from New York originally, and it it really took me a while to get used to the fact that like you just have to get in the car and drive and spend some time in there, and it'll be worth it in the end. Um, so that's you know, unlike most people um, during the pandemic who got to kind of go out and like explore their own backyards and really get to know what was around them, um, for personal reasons, I ended up abroad for most of COVID. So now I'm back here and I'm really trying to see, get to know California. Um, I only moved in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. So in the past few months, um, I've done San Diego, Santa Barbara, um, Palm Springs, Ojai, so I've, I've really been trying to get out and, and get there. I haven't been to Northern California since pre-pandemic, but it's on my list really soon. And I have a um, Tahoe road trip planned over the summer. I've only been to Tahoe in winter, so I'm excited to do that. But I guess my takeaway generally is just, yeah, get in the car and, and 
see what's around you, even if you have to drive for two hours or, or more. Um, I'm really lucky. I feel really lucky to live here. There's such a, you know, diverse landscapes to see and different things to do. And so many great resorts in California that like, even if I don't go far at all, I feel like I'm completely on vacation. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Awesome. That's why we call California the road trip Republic. Love to hear those stories. And Laura. Um, well, unfortunately, the last place I traveled was not California, but I will um, share a little bit of my California credentials. Um, my mom actually grew up in Pacific Grove, um, so California is very near and dear to my heart. And I have also briefly lived in Newport Beach um, and in West Hollywood. Um, and a few years ago, I had the privilege of running the Big Sur Marathon. So um, definitely California is someplace that I'm familiar with and love. Um, the last place I traveled, I actually returned uh, last week from um, the Caribbean island of Grenada, um, which is beautiful. I highly recommend it. Um, its nickname is the Spice Island, um, which has to do with the insane amount of spices that just grow wild in this place. So if you've never seen a nutmeg tree, you'll see them everywhere. You'll see clove bushes, um, wild turmeric. Um, so that was something that just kind of blew my mind as someone who loves to cook and, you know, knows how valuable good spices are, but highly recommend it if you, um, love the Caribbean and want to visit a place that is still really rich in culture and history. Um, it was great. That sounds awesome. I, I appreciate you breaking us in slowly on the non-California trip too. All right, um, so let's uh, jump into a couple of audience questions. Um, we're coming up on our time here, but uh, I'm gonna try to get a couple of these in. Um, from, from Michael in uh, Balboa Park in San Diego um, asks, uh, what are you seeing, if anything, from your audiences about cultural tourism, travel for arts and culture experiences? Is it increasing, staying, you know, not, not on the radar, where, where are we with that? Um, so let's start with, with you, Nina, for that question. So arts and culture is always a, a big part of what we do. Um, we have been seeing more success with it lately, kind of as a part of a bigger picture. Um, so if we're doing a guide to a destination, it's something that we always include there. That's, that's performed better for us sort of in that like well-rounded coverage than it has a sort of one-off stories generally. Um, but in terms of, you know, experiencing different cultures um, as you travel, that's something that we have been trying to do more of, not necessarily from a traffic standpoint, but from, you know, a brand standpoint and just understanding the importance of it um, and trying to instill that in our readers. Um, we have a better together section on our site, it's called, um, that focuses on on a lot of that and one thing that we've been trying to make a real effort of is um having the people having someone who is from that culture actually write that story which sounds you know sounds basic but it's something that hasn't always happened in the past um so that's a really big focus for us now um for example i just had I, I just spoke to the Hawaii Tourism Board. We've been getting so many pitches um, about, you know, uh, traveling to Hawaii and experiencing Hawaiian culture, but I want to have a Hawaiian writer do that. Um, so that's something that we're really thinking about. Great. Um, Laura, anything to chime in on around cultural tourism trends? Yeah. Um, you know, to add to what Nina said, obviously on trip, a lot of the trends that we see um, are pretty much in tandem with TNL. Um, you know, I think we see a lot of interest, um, particularly around places that people can go that kind of give them a glimpse into um, like a different culture, like one story that we did last year that did really well for us um, and actually included um, LA was places that people could go um, to visit and immerse themselves in different cultures. So for example, DC has little Ethiopia, Koreatown in LA. Um, you know, I think people 
are people really like this idea of traveling domestically, but still, um, you know, feeling like they're immersing themselves in something different, whether that's through cuisine, architecture, art. Um, as Nina noted, we still haven't fully seen the interest ramp up in international travel. So we're always looking for ways to um, focus on culture and diversity domestically when we can. Great. Um, okay, a, a couple other questions we can jump on real quick. Uh, this is from Terry Marshall about um, staffing shortages. Certainly, hospitality is feeling that. I know on the media side, you're also feeling that. Um, but on the hospitality side, in many cases, it, it, it has impacted service levels, and and then you know travelers are 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 being very negative on on online reviews and other forums like that. Any um, any thoughts on on how the travel professionals on, in the audience this morning might be able to to navigate that? Anything that you might be able to do to help us as we navigate that challenge? I'll just throw that one out there. Anybody can jump in. Seems to be a head scratcher. Yeah. It is. It, it's a big. It is. Every, a big everybody's dealing with this. Just finding employees and good employees is tough. Yeah, I think. I think like talking about it up front is is a good thing to do um, because I've definitely been in situations where I've just even anecdotally like overheard people getting upset about about service at certain places in in recent months and um, sometimes if, if people are reasonable, once it's brought up that, you know, we are super understaffed and everyone's dealing with this right now, I think people can tend to be a bit more understanding. Um, so I think instead of, you know, trying to hide it, it's good to just get it out in the open and be honest about it. I agree, Nita. I think you just uh, sometimes just going to put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you were the, if you were the guest, right, you were the customer, how, how do you want to be treated? How do you, because I think, uh, a lot of people are dealing with this. And if you just sort of talk about a little bit of upfront, there's a little more understanding because we're all in the same boat. What about the other side of, of that coin? On your side, COVID challenges, people weren't able to travel um, and, and, and now staffing shortages in many cases. Has that changed how you want PRs to be pitching you? Um, are your teams out traveling again? What, what's the status there? Our team has seen, oops, sorry. No, go, go ahead. Um, our team has seen a big uptick in travel, I would say, probably just within the past month or two. Um, but, you know, it was definitely challenging um, to get our team out there during the peak of the pandemic. Um, it was easier for us in some sense that a lot of the writers that we work with and part of um, Trip Savvy's focus is working with writers who live in the destination that they're writing about. Um, so for instance, um, some of you may know her, we work with Carrie Bell in Los Angeles, who's wonderful. And so, you know, she was on the ground um, in LA during the pandemic and was a great voice to have keeping us updated as, you know, restaurants opened or closed or pivoted. Um, and so that was kind of how we worked to make sure that our coverage was relevant and sensitive to the situation. Um, and still be useful to our readers too. Someone else wanna jump in on that one? Yeah, um, I would definitely second what Laura said in terms of the pandemic did kind of push us to make sure that we did have these contributors in different places around the world when we couldn't, when we couldn't send people. Um, our team also is back out traveling now. Um, you know, we've been reassessing every time that a new um, variant comes out or something happens. So it's it's been a lot of back and forth and overnight pivoting, but currently, yes, uh, they're, they're traveling. Um, one little fun addition to our site since um, Dot Dash has been our About Us page, um, which is just, I believe, travelandleisure.com slash about us um, or about dash us. And um, you can kind of meet the whole team on there and, and see who our full-time staff is and, and who to pitch what. There's a there's a whole section on pitch guidelines and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I feel pretty lucky in terms of the, the current size of our team and, and it's just a really strong team of editors who um, are really just all working together to, to um, get us 
lots of good traffic and lots of great content on the site. Um, so I, I would suggest if you haven't checking that out um, and just there might be someone you don't even know is on the team. And, and I think most people here do know, but we did add a second full-time editor um, based out of Los Angeles, Maya Katru Levine, so. Great. Yeah, and I'll just second that. We've same thing since the dot dash acquisition at parents. We've we've just rebuilt our our about us page and our editorial guidelines, and we're also building out our, uh, an expert review board. So about twenty different experts in in all different kinds of fields, between you know OBGYNs to pediatricians, but also you know child psychologists, but then um, also you know any any expert that's going to touch on the parenting space, so that we make sure that every piece of content we have is reviewed by the right the right people um and that's just all part of building that building that trust but um I, yeah i would also recommend going to parents.com slash about i think it's like us um to see who's on our editorial team also but we've been moving away we had staff staff writer positions in the past and we're moving away from that uh, to lean more towards having staff editors and then having an editorial budget to commission out the actual writing and the content we just think that's really important when it comes to showcasing a wide variety of parenting experiences and voices um and it's you know we don't we want to make sure that we're not trying to kind of like speak for for all parents um ourselves all the time excellent um a follow-up question from rachel in monterey uh with with press trips starting up again um what are your thoughts on on group trips versus individual trips is that um what would you like to see as those in-person trips start to come back we'll, we'll stay with you julia for that um, I love it when it's a trip I can actually bring my kid on because sometimes I, I expected to kind of like write on parenting experiences, but then I'm, I don't bring my kid with me. So whatever that looks like, I don't really mind if it's a bigger group or, or whatever, but, um, I mean, one of my favorite press trips I went on was at, um, the, the Atlantis in, in the Bahamas, and they were just so excellent about showing, allowing my daughter to see the kids club, but then also experience the child care services that they had there. And so I was really able to experience it truly as a parent and not just in parenting while I was parenting there, not just kind of like as a parent without my child. So that's the only thing I would say when it comes to kind of covering um, family travel. Yeah. Makes sense. I'd love to go by myself though. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah. I don't mind um, group trips. I probably do take fewer group trips than I used to. Um, I think one of the best things that I do like to see sometimes when on, when on a group trip, um, particularly if it's hosted by um, a tourism board or a DMO, is um, different tracks for different interests. Um, you know, just the recognizance that certain activities on the trip might not appeal to everyone's story needs or publication needs um, and being flexible to that is always appreciated. Um, so for me, it just kind of, you know, depends on the trip and the destination um, as to whether I prefer group or individual. Um, yeah, I think at TNL, we very much agree with that. Um, we prefer, and we always prefer individual, I would say, um, mainly for the reason that Laura is sort of alluding to, which is, you know, I don't, we don't like to be on a, on a group trip with a bunch of other journalists getting the same story, you know? Um, so on a group, very important to have different tracks for sure. Um, I think also individuals are preferred um, because potentially you can have a more sort of authentic experience, what the trip would be like if you were going rather than being kind of ushered around as a little tour group. Um, but I think it just needs to be done in the right way where it's not a hard no on groups for us or anything. Great. Um, all right, our last question um, from Mike in Paso Robles, and we'll start with you, Nina, since you're road tripping a lot. Um, Mike's wondering, in Northern and Southern California, both with gateway cities, get a ton of attention. What's the impression uh, or thoughts on the Central Coast? We just had a Central Coast story really take off on TNL. Um, it was either last week or early this week, actually. Um, I'll find it after I'm done talking and put it in the chat. Um, but, you know, like I said earlier, this whole small town and hidden gem kind of thing working great for us has been, has really been giving um, the Central Coast its moment, um, which I very much think it deserves. And um, I have 
myself more of it to much more of it to explore, but I think it's exactly the type of place that our readers are actually really looking for right now. Maybe the best hotel I've ever stayed at is it called the Hotel Cheval, in downtown Paso Robles. Amazing place. Wow, high praise. That's great. Laura, any thoughts on Central Coast? Yeah, I mean, like Nina said, um, we've seen a lot of success with Central Coast content. Um, you know, I think we've sent editors or writers on a couple of trips um, and just speaking to their experience on the ground, um, they always come back having rave things to say. So we love Central Coast. Um, you know, if you are involved with a city or a place there, like, please send us anything interesting going on because it does perform well for us. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists, Michael, Nina, Laura, Julia. Thank you. We really appreciate your time today uh, and your, your ongoing partnership with us at Visit California and destinations across the state. So thank you as well to our audience for joining and making time this morning. We hope this was valuable and um, please share the recording with colleagues that uh, weren't able to join today.